Hamilton, who was then a PhD student at the Institute and formerly involved in civil society and political reform and beliefs. That we first um, started the idea of beginning a project on democracy in the Caribbean. Significant anniversaries of independence, um, Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago, reaching their 50 year milestone in 2012, have stimulated soul searching and analysis um, of the record of independence in the region itself. Not least, for example, in the 5050 project initiated by Professor Brian Meeks um, and others at Salisa at the University of the West Indies, Mono. In the UK, there's um, a handful of people who work on post independence political history and contemporary politics of the region. So, creating um, a larger international network makes sense to get the critical mass of scholars and others who are working on governance more broadly um, uh, to gather them around to work on the same similar themes. So, we formed a steering group of the Westminster and Caribbean project, and here I'd like to thank uh, the steering group members. It's Dylan Vernon from UCL, Professor Brian Meeks, Yuri Mona, and Peter Clegg of the University of West of England, um, who will be with us tomorrow. The shift from an assessment of Caribbean democracy more broadly to focus specifically on the Westminster model had both a pragmatic and an intellectual rationale. The project um, is funded by the AHRC, for which we're very grateful, um, for a period of two years. And this particular grant stream had um, an emphasis on translating cultures, which fits very well with the idea of looking at how the Westminster model was translated uh, in the Caribbean. But there are other good reasons for turning again to the question of how the Westminster model has functioned in the Caribbean. As many of you will know, um, scholarship assessing the record of Westminster in the Caribbean began to be conducted in a, a more sustained way in the late 1980s and early 1990s when countries like Jamaica, Barbados, Guyana and Trinidad and Tobago were reaching a quarter century of independence. But others, like St. Kitts and Nevis, for example, had less than a decade of sovereignty under their belt. This early scholarship um, focused mainly on the formal dimensions of democracy and on the whole it took a mainly positive view of the model's effectiveness in producing um, stable, liberal democratic states in the region. Jorge Dominguez, in his 1993 article, The Caribbean Question, Why Has Liberal Democracy Surprisingly Flourished?, states, for example, that no other region in what has been called the Third World has had, for so long, so many liberal democratic polities, adding that this Caribbean achievement is far superior to that of Latin America, and also to the countries of Africa and Asia that acquired their formal independence from European powers after the Second World War. He continues, the former British colonies in the Caribbean have also had a far superior capacity to sustain liberal democratic politics than most former British colonies in Asia and Africa have done, and have done so with much lower levels of violence. This um, positive assessment has been reinforced by um, quantitative assessments of the region in global rankings such as the worldwide governance indicators, which rank the 12 independent states of the Commonwealth Caribbean above all other developing regions on all of their chosen indicators, including voice and accountability, political stability, control of corruption and rule of law. Yet there's clearly another side to this story. In the last few decades, the Caribbean has undergone radical changes which bring into question the more optimistic assessments of the early scholarship and the surface view offered by such governance uh, rankings. As many of the scholars at this conference have identified, neoliberal globalisation, the transnational drugs trade, rising crime levels and the economic downturn are undermining the power of the state in the region. Several have argued that liberal democracy, which the Westminster model was assumed to produce, um, is in crisis. <coughs> Selwyn Ryan um, has stated that liberal democracy is in grave danger in the Caribbean. Professor Norman Gervin, giving the keynote today, has spoken of existential threats to the viability of Caribbean societies. It seems um, timely, therefore, in the light of current debates on the evolution and the perceived decline of democracy in the region, to return to the question of the Westminster model, its impact and its legacies. The Westminster Caribbean Network um, seeks then to address the need for an expanded and an updated analysis of the experience of Westminster and the Caribbean, um, looking at its historical roots and legacies, its impact on Caribbean democracy, and the challenges that it has faced over the last 50 years. 
to pursue these themes, we've identified three main research strands, adaptations, critiques, and regeneration, or perhaps better reform of the Westminster model. So the first research strand revisits how the Westminster model was transplanted and adapted to the different territories of the region, each with their different histories of colonisation, dates of independence, um, size, populations and ethnic demographics. How have these factors influenced the nature and impact of the Westminster model in different locations? Why, for example, has the model been seen as contributing to ethnic divisions in Guyana and Trinidad when it has not produced the same divisions in multi-ethnic beliefs? What are the limits of the model in the Caribbean context? What role has it played in distortions of democracy, such as divisive winner-takes-all politics, rubber stamp parliaments, and the entrenchment of patronage systems? These questions um, apply not only to the 12 independent states of the Commonwealth Caribbean, but also to the non-independent states of the British Overseas Territories where, um, as a recent case of the Turks and Caicos um, illustrates, the relationship with London has been rather more direct. In a decision that CARICOM denounced at the time as an attempt to recolonize the islands, the British government imposed direct rule in August 2009 in response to allegations of systemic corruption and, quote, chronic ills collectively amounting to a national emergency. The suspension of the constitution, the end of self-rule and the return of direct rule from London was described by the UK's Daily Telegraph newspaper as a rare modern day example of the return rather than the retreat of the British colonial reach. As was well understood by Caribbean thinkers at the time, this colonial reach did not disappear after independence and might be seen in the persistence of the Westminster model as the basis for the political system adopted at independence and in the values of the political elites who had been socialised into its norms. As Percy Hinson argues, the legacy of British colonialism has caused even the most critical and challenging minds of the region to accept the Westminster parliamentary model suitably adapted as the sine qua non of democratic governance. There have, however, been critical voices in the region who have challenged the applicability and even the legitimacy of the Westminster model in the Caribbean. Our second research strand, Critiques, um, looks at political theories, movements and practices in the Caribbean that directly challenge the Westminster model of government. These might include intellectual groupings such as the New World Group and the Tapia Movement, who sought to articulate Caribbean solutions to Caribbean problems, MJAC in Trinidad's critique of conventional politics and search um, for a model of people's participation that was uh, embodied in their people's parliaments in Woodford Square. And more dubiously, it might include the doctrine of party paramountcy introduced in Rome's Guyana, one of the clear exceptions to the region's assumed liberal democratic norm. One of the most radical challenges to, West, to, to the Westminster model is, of course, the Grenada Revolution. In a pamphlet entitled Revolutionary Democracy, Not Westminster Hypocrisy, the PRG outlined a sustained critique of the holy tablets that we have received from the heights of Westminster foisted upon us and which we regard as decreed in place by the maker himself. This is not just the famous formulation against five-second democracy and its formal institutions. In the PRG's view, the cult of Westminster, the acceptance of the view that the English-speaking Caribbean had inherited the best of all worlds, fostered a complacency that obscured the real challenges facing Caribbean societies. <coughs> because of the innocuousness of Caribbean regimes, the pamphlet stated, because our government would only periodically resort to beating us over the head in the streets or banning from our shores the most lucid and articulate of our Caribbean compatriots, we thank our lucky stars and continue to live with the problems of underdevelopment. It does not occur to us that our continuing underdevelopment could have anything to do with the nature of the political framework in which we consent to function. Thirty years ago next month, the Grenadian experiment in alternative democracy came to a crushing end. In looking at the alternatives that have been articulated in the region, um, it's necessary to ask if their failure can be seen as a success of the Westminster system, testimony perhaps to its legitimacy in the region and its robustness. Moving on from the radical alternatives, the third research strand is concerned with um, contemporary processes of political reform. Current um, anxieties about democratic decay in the region have reopened debates about reforming the Westminster system 
and several countries have established um, constitutional reform commissions that have raised such issues as um, bringing in term limits for the Prime Minister, fixed election dates, and checks and balances on the executive. In March this year, Trinidad launched a national consultation on constitutional reform, described as an exercise in enlightened citizenship, with consultations taking place across the country. But as Cynthia Barron-Giles has argued, it remains to be seen whether the political elites will demonstrate the necessary political will to implement the recommendations of various reform commissions. What reforms are being discussed? Are they minimalist tweaks to the existing system or are more substantive um, reforms of democracy on the table? Are citizens engaged with these processes of political reform? Is the region ultimately moving towards a post-Westminster era? So to pursue all these themes is clearly um, a long-term project. For the duration of uh, this grant period, we'll be exploring these through uh, two conferences, this one and another one to be held at MoMA in September 2014, as well as um, a series of smaller events throughout the course of the year. Um, we're also not quite launching here today, but showing you here today uh, the Westminster in the Caribbean website, which will soon go live on www.westminsterinthecaribbean.com. Um, and this includes an online Caribbean democracy bibliography, which we hope uh, we'd like to build that up with your help. I'll say more um, towards the end of the conference about where we go next. Um, but in the meantime, just to say that we will value your input over the next uh, couple of days and what you think the network could do. Um, speakers, themes, contributions to the webpage and so forth. Um, so once again, welcome um, and I look forward to the debates over the next couple of days. Um, I'm going to move on now to the main business of the conference and introduce our keynote speaker. Um, it's a real pleasure for me and an honour to introduce our keynote speaker this morning, Professor Norman Gervin. Norman Gervin is Professor Emeritus of the University of the West Indies and was until recently Professorial Research Fellow at the UE Graduate Institute of International Relations. In the course of a career spanning five decades and counting, Professor Gervin has shown a consistent concern with developing strategies for independent development and self-empowerment in the Caribbean and the Global South. After completing his doctorate at the LSE in early 1966, he joined the UE Economics Department at St. Augustine, later transferring to Mona, where he taught until 1973. As founding member of the New World Group, Professor Gervin was a central participant in the intellectual, in the radical intellectual and political ferment of the Caribbean in the 1960s and 70s as a generation of intellectuals sought to indigenize economic and social thought in the region. In 1977, he joined the Michael Manley administration as head of the government's planning agency, working on an alternative to the proposed IMF plan. Since then, Professor Gervin has continued to operate across the worlds of academia, policy, and regional development. He has been Professor of Development Studies and Director of the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute of Social and Economic Studies at the University of the West Indies and has published extensively on the political economy of development in the Caribbean and the global south. From 2000 to 2004, he served as Secretary General of the Association of Caribbean States and since 2009 has been a member of the United Nations Committee on Development Policy. In 2010, he was appointed as the UN Secretary General's personal representative in the Guyana-Venezuela border controversy. One of the Caribbean's most distinguished intellectuals, he is also a passionate advocate of Caribbean regionalism and continues to offer penetrating analysis of the major issues confronting the Caribbean in the world system today. Please join me then in welcoming um, Professor Norman Gervin to speak to us this morning on assessing Westminster in the Caribbean then and now. Good to be here. Um, I wasn't too sure why, as a non political scientist and non constitutionalist, I was um, really given this job, but I thought that there must be a reason. So um, let me have some fun. <laughs> so we go right into it. Um, Jamaica became an independent nation. 
in August 6, 1962. And at that time, I had just turned what was then the age of majority. That's to say 21. So we can work, it out, work out my age from that. And the coming of age, um, my own coming of age, at the same time as Jamaica's, so to speak, seemed to be made a little choice, uh, but to embrace the national project. And indeed, this was the mission of my generation, the generation that came of age at that time. But additionally, for my own cohort at the West Indian University, national meant regional. The West Indies was and is our nation. Let me say right out that we were not enamored of the West the Westminster model. Our circle of students and young faculty, drawn mainly from the social sciences of history, called itself the Society for the Study of Social Issues, the precursor of the New World Group, which met regularly at that time to discuss issues of development on what we all assumed to be the independent West Indian nation. We wrote papers that critiqued colonial economy, colonial society, and colonial polity. And we proposed corresponding anti-colonial models. In the political dimension, the, pol the politics of colonialism was diagnosed as the politics of authoritarianism and of exclusion. And the politics of independence would therefore have to be the politics of participation. Walter Rodney, well known to all of you, I'm sure, was the author of these two papers, Politics of Colonialism and Politics of Independence. Therefore, uh, it followed that the population would need to be mobilized for the tasks of nation building and the creation of a just society. And this had nothing to do with with the Westminster model. In my reading, Westminster was one element of a larger package. I like to think of this package as the independence pact in the British Caribbean. That pact was not about independence. It was about preservation of the status quo. Its essential features, and here I'm referring to the Jamaican case, but with minor variations, I believe that that applies to the other territory. <clears throat> its essential features were entrenchment of property rights in the Constitution, entrenchment of the two-party system, third, preservation of the laws, the institutions, and the symbols of the colonial state and fourth, alliance with the Western powers in the Cold War. I illustrate some of these features by sharing some personal recollections and observations of my last year as a third year student in the UCLA. In early 1962, immediately after, shortly after the referendum which broke up the Federation and in the run-up to Jamaica's independence, Several of us attended sessions held in Kingston to solicit the views of the public on the design of the Jamaica Independence Constitution. Our main concern at the time was with the retention of the monarchy. As to say, our main concern was the criticism of the We argued that it was contrary to the psychological necessities of nation building, that the Queen of England should be the head of state of independent Jamaica. Looking back, I have to confess to a feeling of grudging admiration for this ingenious device. It had the effect of embedding the core symbol of colonial governance into the institutions and the fabric of the independent state. It connoted continuity 
rather than rot. And I would also argue that it institutionalized a fractured psyche of political allegiance among those who were to be responsible for running the affairs of the state by a fractured psyche. Imagine what it does to the state of mind of the governor general, prime minister, ministers of government, parliamentary secretaries, members of parliament, and of the judiciary. When, as a condition of assuming and holding office, each of these officers are required to take an oath, oath to be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, her heirs and successors. This particular feature of the Constitution was the target of a scathing polemic by Orlando Patterson, who I also think was the most of them, who in an editorial in the student newspaper accused Jamaica's political leaders of a cynical betrayal of the masses. Indeed, he declared, and I mean no offense to anyone, but I quote, that Jamaica's political leaders had been, quote, brainwashed in the rank urine of British culture. <laughs> Regarding public consultation, I don't know why I'm going to go that time. <laughs> <laughs> Regarding public consultation, my distinct recollection is that the sessions to which I referred were attended by a mere handful of individuals, and that no one believed that they were meant to be taken seriously as making an input into the design of the Constitution. I believe that the template of the Constitution must have been supplied by the colonial office. Indeed, there was a joke that they were all printed off somewhere, and what happened is that the name of the newest country <laughs> was simply substituted. And there's an apocryphal story of when a mistake was made in the name of the particular country concerned. The details of the Constitution, however, were negotiated by a joint select, select committee of the Jamaican House of Representatives. That's to say of representatives of the two main political parties that had emerged from the labor and the nationalist movements in the 1930s. The Constitution is structured in such a way that these two parties are virtually guaranteed an indefinite duopoly of political power. I'm not sure how it works in the other, in the other territories concerning <coughs> independence. But certainly in the Jamaican case, it is virtually impossible to change the Constitution without the agreement of both parties. And the only way in which such a change could override that agreement is by the holding of a national referendum, which, which produced the delivers a result either two-thirds or three-quarters. Of, the, um, of those voting. I recall also that the entrenchment of property rights was inserted at the insistence of one of the richest men in Jamaica, <coughs> an owner of the island's daily newspaper. I remember Sir Alexander Bustamante, Jamaica's first prime minister, giving a speech in which he said, and when he saw the last British soldiers departing from Jamaica, I quote, <coughs> tears almost came to my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I recall that when he was asked what Jamaica's foreign policy would be, he replied simply, we are with the West. <laughs> I remember him saying that communism would come to Jamaica, quote, over my dead body and that one of his first actions in office was to offer the United States a military base. Indeed, Bustamante's own relationship with the British legacy 
as we can see from his manner of death, dress, and deportment, was a quaint mixture of fulsome admiration and self-serving manipulation. One of the many stories about him is that in 1946, when he had, he had been charged with manslaughter arising out of a political incident, but was acquitted, acquitted. On leaving the court before an adoring crowd, he shouted, Long live British justice! Long live the British Empire! And long live me! <laughs> 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 the implanting of colonial ways of thinking into native elites was clearly one of the outstanding successes of British policy in the Caribbean. It was key to the entrenchment of Westminster government in the soon-to-be independent states. In an insightful essay called The Myth of Independence, the political scientist Louis Lindsay quoted from a speech delivered by the then Premier of Jamaica, Norman Manley, five months before Jamaica independence, in which he said, the British Constitution is the best in the world, the only good system of government. He expressed pleasure and satisfaction that Jamaican leaders had done nothing which would have jeopardized the country's chances to, re to receive, to receive use of the institutions of Westminster government. He asserted, Mr. Manley, I make no apology for the fact that we did not attempt to embark upon any original or novel exercise in constitutional law. Let's not make the mistake of describing as colonial institutions which are part and parcel of the heritage of this country. End of quote. And indeed, over in Trinidad and Tobago, Prime Minister Dr. Eric Williams, that fierce critic of colonialism, capitalism, and slavery, was declaring, quote, if the parliamentary system is good enough for England, then it is good enough for us. Consider the striking contrast between sentiments of this kind of Caribbean leaders and those expressed by Patrice Lumumba in the ceremony marking the independence of the Congo just two years earlier. Speaking in the presence of the King of Benjamin, Lumumba said, Quote, although this independence of the Congo is being proclaimed today by agreement with Belgium, an amicable country with which we are on equal terms, no Congolese will ever forget that independence was won in struggle, a persevering and un an inspired struggle carried on from day to day. A struggle in which we were undaunted by privation and or suffering and stinted by the strength of blood. It was filled with tears, fire, and blood. We are deeply proud of our struggle because it was just and noble and indispensable in putting an end to the humiliating bondage towards the past. End of hope. Of course, it is a matter of historical record that there is a sense in which the Murma paid for those words with his life. Let me make a few more observations about the Jamaica, Jamaica Constitution. Reading that Constitution today is like a surreal experience. There is great difficulty in thinking of it as the constitution of an independent state. The document is actually a royal order and council. It begins with the words, at the court in Buckingham Palace. <laughs> and this is followed by eight pages 
of language which it is virtually impossible to decide. <laughs> you will not find anything in this document remotely like a reference to the sovereignty of the people or even the sovereignty of parliament. In fact, in the original version, which was not changed until a few years ago, the Jamaican people are not referred to as such anywhere. Nor is there any reference to social and economic rights of the kind Adam Brayton in the United Nations job. Indeed, it was not until 49 years later that the Constitution was amended by the incorporation of a Charter of Fundamental Rights and Freedoms. And the final judicial authority in respect to this Constitution, including on matters concerning the interpretation of the Constitution itself, is the British Privy Council. And this remains the case in many, if not most, of the English-speaking United States of the region. So I spoke about a pact. <coughs> and behind the independence pact, or I would say that the independence pact was made between the British with the Americans hovering watchfully in the background, of course, and the Jamaican political class that had emerged out of the mass movements of the Virgins. The pact was that the Jamaicans would exercise formal political authority, but real power would reside elsewhere. My doctoral thesis, for example, showed that at the time of independence, American, British, and Canadian firms were entrenched in bauxite mining, in sugar, in banking and finance, while local landowners and merchants control the best land, tourism, and import trade, all the levers of economic power. A key element in this system of control would be a security apparatus with close links to the imperialist system. The core of the newly established Jamaica Defense Force was the Colonial West India Regiment. <coughs> Officers attended courses at the Royal Military Academy at Sandhurst. Ties with the United States were doubtless established soon after independence. Recently declassified colonial administrative records by uh, called the Migrated Archives, shows that in the lead up to, the Jamaica, to Jamaica's independence, the British authorities, through this local special branch of the Jamaican police, were engaged in a variety of individuals and organizations, were engaged in surveillance of a variety of individuals and organizations thought to represent potential threats to the system. That surveillance was carried out with the full knowledge and support of the elected ministers in the Jamaican government. I spent a couple of days earlier this week looking at some of these archives which have now been declassified. The targets of the security forces, the, the, the local security apparatus, included the Universal Negro Improvement Association, the descendant of the Marcus Garvey movement, the World Federation of Democratic Youth. Mr. Dudley Thompson, who had defended Jomo Kenyatta in Kenya and later became Jamaica's foreign minister. Harold and Kathleen Drake, school teachers from Guyana and Trinidad, respectively. <coughs> His son, Dr. Richard Drake, is now Professor of Imperial History. <laughs> <laughs> Appropriately. Rhodes Professor of Imperial History at London University. I thank, I thank Richard, who is with us, for having facilitated and explained to me the ins and outs of the National Archives. 
In addition, the British authorities in London were vetting staff appointments at the University College of the West Indies <coughs> for communists, for being communists, or communist associations. This practice was apparently stopped only at the insistence of the newly appointed principal, Professor Arthur Lewis, who pointed out the consideration of the political views of staff faculty members was contrary to the charter of the university college. The local special branch, as well as the colonial governors in Jamaica and the governor general of the West Indies, were especially concerned about possible local repercussions of the Cuban Revolution. They objected to an ultimately block a visit to Cuba by a group of students from the UCWI. You can see that was quite a thick fact uh, in the archives, which I had the pleasure of viewing. Um, and this was indeed blocked, although Professor Lewis, when he was asked to stop the visit, uh, pointed out that it would be, it would be ridiculous. There are some very interesting comments. In his, um, in his letter. But nonetheless, the government of Jamaica refused permission for the Cuban aircraft to land. So the result that the visit did not take place. And I felt this very personal because I was to have been a member of that group <laughs> myself. <laughs> Professor Lewis, by the way, in his letter, which was quite interesting, said, no students are going to be converted to communism by going to Cuba. In fact, on their return, they are going to be um, petitioned by many Cuban students to come back and to leave, to leave Cuba. They have nothing to fear. And there are several files on Cuban activities in Jamaica. The arrival of, arrival of ships and planes from Cuba, the banning of shipments of arms to Cuba, although banning uh, exports of arms to Central American dictatorships um, were allowed. And of course, it's a safe bet that all this stuff was shared with the Americans, and that the collaboration between the Jamaican Special Branch, branch the British and the Americans, continued seamlessly after independence. So this was a grand imperial strategy. I believe that what, what I have said about the Jamaican independence back is largely true for the entire British Caribbean. The proof of this is the lengths to which the British and the Americans went to ensure that Dr. Jenny Jagan, an avowed Marxist, would not govern an independent British Guiana. The recently declassified records tell the sordid story of this episode. And we now know that this, is a grand this was a grand imperial strategy of the, all the colonial powers in Africa and in Asia. In the essay to which I earlier referred, Louis Lindsay concluded, quote, that the formal granting of the right of self-determination to traditionally devalued peoples of the Afro-Asian and Caribbean world was accompanied by a devaluation of the meaning of independence itself. <coughs> the core of the myth of independence, he theorizes, quotes, centers on the substitution of procedural and legalistic criteria for functional and substantive ones, end of quote. He drew on the powerful insights of Franz Fanon and insisted that the intent and effect of the strategy was to co-opt nationalist leaders and preempt the possibility that the anti-colonial struggle would take the form of a revolutionary mobilization. That's to say, one which would result in the psychological self-emancipation of the colonized people and transform the institutions and structures of colonial rule. So, half a century of Westminster. Looking back over the past half century, we see both continuity and change. 
At one level, the colonialist strategy succeeded very well. The populations have been diverted from any agenda of revolutionary transformation. Politics is a perpetual game of alternating ins and outs and will take all. It's characterized mainly by mudslinging, sens sensationalism, and an endless game of trivial pursuit. <laughs> Every five years, a cornucopia of election campaign promises are made, few are kept. People participation is limited to cheering at election rallies and the 10 second act of voting every five years, or is it five seconds? <laughs> Government is reduced to prime ministerial dictatorship. And importantly, long term issues of development are hardly ever on the agenda of popular political discourse. But at the same time, there is change. The attempt to introduce Westminster into countries with deep social and ethnic cleavages, dependent economies, and a culture of authoritarianism and of social exclusion has given to rise to all sorts of contortions. So that what often passes for Westminster today is a grotesque distortion of the original. Let's return to the Jamaican case. In the 1970s, the government of Michael Manning introduced wide-ranging social reforms, redistributed income, and expanded state control over their economy. It took steps to address the social debt that was the legacy of 300 years of colonialism, slavery, and the plantation system. The empire and the local oligarchy struck back Mr. Manley's experiment was crippled by capital flight, shrinking export revenues, and IMF mandated austerity, together with a campaign of violent political destabilization. By the end of 1980, he had been voted out of office, and it was back to business as usual. The late Carl Stone theorized Jamaican politics as a system of patronage and clientelism. Electors, especially those in constituencies consisting of the poor and socially excluded, exchange their votes for jobs and other social benefits. Where there is not enough for everyone, inter-party violence often results. A former prime minister, P.J. Patterson, once said in a moment of candor that Jamaican politics consisted of, quote, warring tribes vying for scarce benefits. Carlstone, however, went further. He saw a trend in the 1980s where the fiscal crisis of the state was drying up the flow of benefits to supporters of the party in power. Drug dons were stepping in to fill the breach. Stone predicted that this would be a game changer in Jamaican politics. The tail would end up wagging the dog. Fast forward to 2010. Christopher Dudos Cope. That's an appropriate surname. <laughs> Wanted in the United States for drug and gun running, had long since established a stronghold in the constituency then represented by the Prime Minister himself, Mr. Bruce Morley. In Tivoli Gardens at the heart of this constitu uh, constituency, Dudas ran teams. Indeed, he was known as Prez. <laughs> and we can be pretty sure that he did not own office by pledging 
allegiance. For over nine months, Golding's administration refused to act on an extradition request from the United States government. When he eventually came in under pressure, there was a virtual urban insurrection in, the, in his own constituency in support of the wanted drug lord. In the end, the forces of the state were sent in to arrest him. With the help of intelligence supplied courtesy from a U.S. drone. <clears throat> when the dust had cleared, the smoke had cleared, over 70 civilians had been killed under circumstances yet to be fully determined. Jamaica was exposed to the kind of international media attention that is the tourist board's nightmare. Dudos <clears throat> himself became one of the most instantly recognizable Jamaican faces in the global media, eclipsed only, but fortunately, by the likes of Bob Marley and Lucy. Oh, <laughs> not the Africans like that in Jamaica. Some international recognition. Duras himself escaped, and he gave himself up several weeks later, waived his, his rights for a hearing in the extradition, was taken to the United States, pleaded guilty to racketeering conspiracy, and conspiracy to commit assault with a dangerous weapon in aid of my racketeering, and is now serving a 23-year jail sentence <laughs> in the United States. Hence my slide at the beginning. Westminster, then it unknown. Golding was forced to call an early election the following year, which he promptly lost. And not surprisingly, after all of this, the prestige of politics and of the national project in the eyes of the Jamaican population plunged to a new low. In the 2011 elections, only one half of the Jamaican electorate turned out. The present administration holds office on the basis of votes of less than one third of qualified electors. Most embarrassingly of all, in a poll taken in mid-2011, 60% of respondents agreed with the statement Jamaica would have been better off had it been made a British colony. <laughs> This as Jamaica approaches 50th independence anniversary. I have to say that this way, with all of these events fresh in mind, and I've said to people, had that poll been held um, immediately after the triumph of Jamaican athletes at the London Olympics, <laughs> and had it been phrased, would you prefer to see the world at all? Singing God Save the Queen, the Jamaican national anthem on the podium. Which would you have preferred? I don't think there would be to what, what answer would have been given. But is it an indication of the sinking prestige of the national project? And the Jamaican case is extreme, but not necessarily atypical. Allegations have been made at one time or another on connections between criminal organizations, political parties, and the state in countries such as Trinidad and Tobago and Guyana. Everywhere in the region, corruption, transparency, and accountability are concerns. The controversy surrounding the role of Mr. Jack Warner of FIFA fame in the government and politics of Trinidad and Tobago is a case in point. Mr. Warnock has held on in succession the portfolios of transport, then works, and then national security in the current administration of Trinidad and Tobago, the government of Trinidad and Tobago. Before he became such a political liability that he was eased out, he promptly resigned his seat and campaigned on his own account for re-election, winning by a landslide. <laughs> and Mr. Warner is now positioning himself in Trinidad politics 
as a champion anti-corruption fighter. <laughs> it is a sign of the political times in which we live that someone of his reputation is being seriously mentioned as a possible future prime minister. Of course, we have had instances of constitutional reform, notably in Guyana and in Trinidad and Tobago. But it's not clear that these reforms have changed the basic concerns about Westminster, many, if not most, of which were mentioned by Kate in her excellent introduction. So I will um, uh, go through all of these. I think they're known to most people here. Uh, the winner take all syndrome, the way in which the system encourages ethnic polarization, the problem of unchecked executive power, the emasculation of legislative power, the absence of um, the, the weakness of local government, non participation of citizens, and finally, corruption and um, the influence of power in political parties which spills over when those parties are in office. But I would argue that, and indeed many of these issues are on the agenda also in this country and in other parts of the world which have the Westminster system or even don't have it, such as the influence on money and politics, which is a major issue in the United States. So to some extent, these concerns are part of a global trend, but that trend assumes a particular shape and form in the region. A shape and form that in part, excuse me, a flavor of acute crisis, if not of terminal decline in the system. Why do I say this? Historically, when you consider the circumstances in which the independence pact was negotiated, we can see where these were underpinned by a very particular set of economic arrangements and circumstances. Key to those arrangements were trade preferences, the buoyancy of export markets, and generous guaranteed flows of economic aid. And in this particular context, the new states had a material base sufficient to pursue projects of national development. But these co conditions corresponded to a particular historical moment in the global political economy. That was the expansion of the international economy from 1945 to the early 1970s, the Cold War, decolonization, and international developmentalism. These underpinned certain assumptions about the availability of resources to the newly independent states. The national project was an integral part of that. And the notion or the notion of the feasibility of insular independence were also based on those assumptions. And of course, those circumstances no longer apply to a significant degree. Since the 1980s, we have had neoliberal globalization global trade rules which have swept away the preferences and also reduced resulted in <coughs> severe reduction of import tariffs. The end of the Cold War, which has pretty much ended the strategic position, the strategic importance of the Caribbean in, in the global of geopolitical equation. And also growing instability in the world economy. The slow down in the economies to which Caribbean economies are tied, the United States and the European Union, and importantly, the threat of climate change. So the trade preferences are gone, and concessional flows <coughs> have dried up to virtually nothing. In many regional countries, export revenues have not kept pace with imports, especially as imports have been liberalized under global trade rules. The uh, concessional inflows have dried up, so governments have gone on to commercial markets um, to finance their capital expending. Tax revenues have not kept pace with government spending. Deficits have grown, and therefore debt rations 
have grown steeply and have just about now reached their limit. At the same time, as these limits have been reached, and now we're talking about at least three uh, or four states which have, which have recently, in the last few years, had either been forced to or voluntarily restructured uh, their external debts. At the same time as these um, pressures on resources and increasing deficits have taken place, there are new spreads and demands on government resources which have emerged with bewildering speed. We now have to cope with the effects of transnational organized crime and of global climate change. I could give you a whole lot of facts and figures about this, but I don't want to burden um, you with a lot of, of statistics. But a convenient way to sum up the situation is to say that the CARICOM Caribbean globally is one of the highest regions on a number of indicators. Debt, burden is a, debt burdens are amongst the highest in the world. The, uh, the average debt burden in the CARICOM Caribbean now is, is more than twice that of Latin America. That's to say the region outside of the country. We have the highest migration rates of skilled manpower, that is to say of tertiary graduates, um, between two-thirds and 90% of the annual uh, output of tertiary institutions. That is to say, the, the, the numbers leaving every year are, represent approximately between two-thirds and 90% of the annual output of tertiary institutions. Again, this is probably the highest in the world, probably only Central America comes close. We have one of the highest uh, ratios of dependence on remittances, which are now the fastest growing source of foreign currency. Remittances since 1990 are significantly greater than overseas development aid and of foreign direct investment and now amount to three times the value of agricultural exports. To a significant extent, Caribbean countries have become exporters of labor services and are, are if you like, a reservoir of labor for developed countries. We also now have one of the highest, if not as a region, the highest rates of homicides um, in, in, of all the regions of the world approximately 30 per 100,000. And along with other small island developing states, we have the highest degree of vulnerability in terms of population and land area to climate change. When I laid out all of these, I said to myself, uh, you're not going to invite you back. <laughs> so I have some good news. Well, the good news is that we have the highest per capita production in the world of medal winning athletes. <laughs> <laughs> Along with it. And we probably have the highest per capita production content. We said that there was a column, I think, Sir Robert Sanders, who said a Chinese diplomat had spent some time in China. A Chinese diplomat who had spent some time in the Caribbean said, no, uh, um, you people have a two-party system in uh, your part of the world. One party by day and another party. <laughs> <laughs> but in the history of the situation, a little more serious again, in analyzing the effects of these phenomena, the thinking and the policies about these issues tends to be compartmentalized. The professional disciplines operate in silos. Government ministries operate in silos. International programs and initiatives operate in silos. So each one is the subject of a particular institution and you get policy 
types of institutions. And that's fine for analysis, and if you like, for specialization and arriving at a deep understanding of these phenomena. But of course, in the real world, they don't work independently of one another. As soon as you leave the lecture room and you go out there, you are faced with the consequences of interrelations, of interrelationships, inter the reality of interrelationships, of feedbacks, of combined effects. And in this instance, I think we have to look out for the perfect storm when all of these interact and produce a downward spiral. For example, a lot of money is needed to adapt to global climate change. A lot of resources are also needed to deal with the threats posed by transnational organized crime. But you're not going to find the money domestically when the economy is stagnant, stagnant because trade preferences have been removed. And the state is already heavily indebted because concessionally imposed on some. You, you borrow, but then there's a limit beyond which you, can, you cannot borrow commercially because you lose credit worthiness. And the growth of the debt, of course, is due, at least partially, to stagnant or shrinking export revenues. Also, concessional funding is also hard to secure because most Caribbean countries are not amongst the world's poorest countries and therefore do not qualify. So, you reach the point, as many countries, several states have reached, where you have no recourse, you can't service the debt, and you have no recourse but to go to the International Monetary Fund. But what does the IMF do? They mandate budget cuts to balance the budget. That means further depletion of resources to fight crime and to adapt to climate change, let alone to, to provide decent health and educational services for your people, to pay your teachers and policemen. So what happens, of course, security continues to decline, and more and more qualified and professionals who have the opportunity to migrate leave, and that further depletes the human resources and the human capital stock, and you, you lose your independence. I did an um, uh, analysis of the degree to which the policies of the Jamaican government now are daily, weekly, and monthly supervised by the local representative of the International Monetary Board, to whom reports have to be made, and came to the conclusion that the influence, if not formal authority, of this officer exceeds, must have exceed, exceeds by a wide margin what must have been the authority of the colonial office. <laughs> in London or in the colonial government at the time of the uh, of Crown Colony rule. So there is a real threat of many regional countries being caught in a vicious downward spiral. We mentioned that I sometimes speak about existential threats. And when I speak about existential threats, I don't mean necessarily the physical, the physical survival or the physical existence of these countries that exist, for example, in some of the Pacific Islands, which are literally threatened with being inundated by rising sea levels. But I'm thinking here of the survival of these territories as viable economies, as functional polities, and as cohesive societies. Because a functional polity, a minimum requirement of a functional polity, is the ability to provide certain basic security and public goods to the population in some sense that is in control of its own affairs. <laughs> and we see the very real possibility, if we're not at the reality, of being caught in a downward, in a downward spiral. And we see this reflected in some of the statements made by leaders of the region, people responsible for the affairs of the region. Take, for example, uh, Dr. Kenny Anthony, who in a speech last year as Prime Minister of St. Lucia. Our region is in the greatest crisis since independence. The specter of evolving into failed societies is no longer a subject of imagination. He went on to say how our societies crawl out of this vicious vortex 
of persistent low growth, crippling debt, huge fiscal deficits, and high unemployment is the single most important question facing us at this time. But you get the sense on the part really, that they don't have the answer. The national project. What has happened to the national project in all of this? Trinidad and Tobago is the most resource rich country in the region. It doesn't have a problem of high debt ratio. It doesn't have a problem of, of resources. And yet, we get a sense of crisis. We get the leader of the oil field workers trade unions, one of the most powerful institutions in the country, a few months back, saying, our beloved country is in a state of crisis. The system of governance has failed. Our post-colonial state has collapsed. This is not what our forefathers fought and died for. He went on to say, there is a feeling of lost hope where the country seems to be spiraling out of control. Our forefathers did not fight to create a society based on individualism. They did not fight for self-governance so that some politicians can pillage and plunder the treasury, enriching themselves. They certainly did not fight to build a country where party financiers reign supreme. Yet this is the kind of country we see being constructed. End of quote. Earlier this year, we have the current Minister of Finance of Jamaica saying, we have not managed our sovereignty. First ability is to manage your affairs and pay your own. And we haven't done that well. This is a, a Minister of Finance, a PhD in political science, a serious thinker as well as administrator saying, we haven't managed our sovereignty. And this is a confession of bankruptcy. In my, let's just say of, if you like, political and possibly intellectual bankruptcy because you don't get a sense that there is a vision of how to get out of this. We have a former Minister of Finance saying, we have been taking decisions which were not sustainable. We were borrowing to be those obligations, we should have seen or felt these issues, but within our own party, we feel we can't make a move because we're going to lose some votes. So here you have pressure, a confession that the pressures of political expediency lead to decisions which are unsustainable and which lead to the situation that is the present minister. Uh, now, of course, Politics is key to all of this. And indeed, it's interesting because most of my colleague economists, I started out like one of the economists, <laughs> arrive at a position where they come to the conclusion that the key to the problem is not economic policy as such, or find the magic of the The key to Resolving these issues is politics, political system, the system of governance. So, you know, whether we're talking about Lloyd Best, or we're talking about Dennis Pandy, George Beckford, we're talking about Terence Parrott, who recently published a book on our human safety, uh, or Sheldon Lee, that's who we said the idea of us. This is, we come to this. Uh, to this conclusion. Politics, how to get out of this? Now, of course, uh, there is a way out. There has to be a way out. We will continue to exist, whatever happens to these societies. We inhabit a space, and we have to make our way out of it. So, in the last bit, I want to just talk about a few things um, to, put, to put on the table. Question, can the national project be rescued? Question of what is the meaning of sovereignty for us in the new global order? What about regionalism? And where does the Westminster system fit into all of this? And it seems to me that these questions are posed very sharply. 
I have the sense that we are at some kind of historical turning point in the region, somewhat perhaps like what it must have been in the 1830s and the 1930s, when the old system was crumbling, but the shape of the new one that was to replace it was still to be clearly defined. If I'm correct in inferring that the national project has run its course, then we need to consider whether the goals and aspirations of the national project are no longer relevant. And I would argue that they are. Central to these goals and aspirations were sovereignty, democracy, justice, and development. And surely these remain as valid as ever. What perhaps needs to be rethought is the manner in which those goals are pursued, or if you prefer to think or to rethink the relationship between form and substance. Let's take the issue of sovereignty for example, which is basic to the national project. We have been accustomed to conflate the notion of sovereignty with the, with the possession of certain constitutional and juridical attributes by the nation state. Perhaps we need to begin a, con a conversation about reconceptualizing sovereignty in broader terms. That's to say, terms such as, for example, the, the concept of policy space, which is implied in the recent discourse of UNTA, the United Nations Conference of Trade and Development, the South Center and other parts of the global South. Terms such as the development of structures, of people empowerment at the local and community level. Concepts such as food sovereignty, energy independence, the endogenous capacity to manage and adapt to climate change, the capacity to secure your borders and provide security to your people, and not just physical security, but economic and social security. The ability, I would argue, in terms of sovereignty, the ability to speak in global fora, knowledgeably and convincingly, about your situation and your interests, and to be taken seriously. Above all, I would argue that the true meaning of sovereignty is found in the capacity of a society and of its citizens to think for themselves and to act on their own behalf. Sovereignty begins in the matter. George Lamming, for example, speaks about the sovereignty of the imagination. Lloyd Best spoke of independent thought as the key to Caribbean freedom. Marcus Garvey spoke of emancipation from mental slavery. Once we reopen the question of sovereignty and detach it from the question <coughs> of juridical and constitutional attributes of a nation state and expand <coughs> the notion and the conversation, we begin to see the possibility of designing forms of regionalism in such a way as to enhance sovereignty and to serve the goals of the national project. In other words, the old thinking opposes regionalism to insular independence and national sovereignty. But the new thinking needs to complement regionalism to national sovereignty. For example, the notion of shared sovereignty has to go on the table. We're talking here of sharing selected attributes of constitutional sovereignty with regional partners so as to enhance the substantive sovereignty of each. Paul and Matthew have spoken concretely about this. We might think of doing this, for instance, in subjects such as security, climate change, food, and negotiation with external donors. In other words, for the nation states in the region 
to agree to transfer some of their juridical and constitutional authority to a regional body where this sovereignty is exercised collectively in furtherance of expanding their substantive sovereignty in these areas. And here I think some really creative thinking is called for. The present structures of CARICOM and the assumptions on which those structures are based are mired in a form of regionalism, which quite frankly impede creative engineering. That is to say the form of intergovernmentalism. And both the national and the regional structures form function on the basis of these assumptions. Now what about the Westminster system? Here again, there's an issue of form versus substance. We need to search for a theory and a practice of Caribbean democracy that break free from the shackles of Westminsterism. We need forms of political participation that privilege informed citizen engagement with the urgent issues of survival and with the nature of the kind of society that we wish to create. Forms of political participation that promote the building of social consensus across the cleavages of class, color, ethnicity, gender, and political tribe. Over 50 years ago, C.L.R. James excited many like myself with his vision of the possibilities of creating Athenian-type democracy in small societies like ours. He argued that in that context, Caribbean countries virtually approximated to communities because of the small scale um, uh, of their uh, existence and therefore it permitted certain kinds of associational forms and collective discussion which was much more difficult to take place in a larger country. And we have experience of these. We have some precedents for these, if you like, for this search. The Caribbean labor movements of the 30s, 40s, and 50s were places where important debates took place on the future of Caribbean society. The preparation of the People's Plan in Jamaica in 1977, Kate mentioned my role in the National Planning Agency. The preparation of that plan was a remarkable exercise in popular participation. We invited and we had thousands of suggestions and proposals from all over the country. This was followed up by the first National Conference of Community Councils in Jamaica, which was held in the late 70s and showed the real possibilities for developing community-based organs of people power. The Grenadian Revolution, mentioned earlier, gave rise to an exciting experience in community participation in the preparation of the national budget of the government. The Caribbean women's movements in the 1980s and 90s have had a visible impact on national policy and still do. All over the region, Caribbean civil society activism is on the rise, campaigning for accountability and transparency in government, for constitutional reform, and for responsible environmental stewardship. <coughs> and indeed, over in Latin America, exciting experiments in participatory democracy are taking place, which I think we in the English-speaking Caribbean uh, would benefit by paying much greater attention. Venezuela, Bolivia, and Ecuador have convened the citizens' assemblies, which have drawn up and approved the new constitutions. Constitutions which establish organs of popular power, community councils, for example, which guarantee the rights of women, social security, or housewives, um, uh, for example. Indigenous minorities, Afro-descendants, and entrenched social and economic rights, including the right of women to be remunerated for unpaid household labor, which is the case in Venezuela. So there are no shortages, there is no shortage of experiences from which we can draw. So 
these are some uh, ideas for an agenda going forward. Reinvention of the national <coughs> project, reconceptualization of sovereignty, redesign of regionalism, and invention of a Caribbean democracy. I say reinvention, but invention of a Caribbean democracy, one that is rooted in our own realities. I hope I have not tread right on your turf for the closing keynote, but I'm sure you're going to go far beyond this. <laughs> so I close with one last personal anecdote. Here in London, I recall some 51 years ago, in a place not too far from here, called Red Lion Square, when I heard C.L.R. James speaking on the prospects for the newly independent states of Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago. And I think I can hear his words now. The gist being that the colonial economy, the colonial system that existed in the West Indies for 300 years, and it was still intact. He said that into the midst of this colonial order had been introduced a creature. I think he even called it a monster called democracy. <laughs> he didn't say the West Indies. We have, and I can hear his words, we have, we have introduced a monster that they call democracy. He went on to say, either the colonial system must go, or democracy must go, <laughs> but that the two could not coexist. And indeed, thinking back and looking back, I rather believe that history has proven CLR James right. The colonial system in its essence is intact, but democracy remains in the city. I wouldn't be so bold as to make predictions for the next 50 years. But clearly, we have a lot of work to do. The challenge is exciting. The possibilities are endless. Thank you very much for your Norman, that was terrific. But can I just take you back to 61 62, since you were there in Jamaica, and ask you about the question of citizenship? If you look at the constitutional debates in much of the Caribbean today, a lot of it rolls around not necessarily citizenship as such, but the right to a foreign passport. In Puerto Rico, one of the reasons why there's such resistance to independence is that they would lose their right to travel to the US, etc. Curacao, Martinique, it's a similar problem. In 61, Britain introduced its first law restricting immigration from empire countries, Commonwealth countries, and obviously that applied to Jamaica as well. Up to that time, Jamaica's had had unrestricted entry to the UK. Was this an issue in those debates surrounding uh, independence in 62? I don't recall specifically that it was an issue, but what I do know is that there was, or, or recall, that there was a class of individuals who um, had the opportunity to choose whether they retained or could apply for a British passport or whether they um, would be required and would, um, to only eligible, um, and was only eligible for a Jamaican passport. I remember that there were some people who had that option and who indeed opted to acquire a British passport because of, uh, for obvious reasons, so to be able to access um, the UK and that these individuals tended to be amongst the, the, the privileged group within the society. I'm not sure what it was if they had to be born in the UK, but for some reason they satisfied certain eligibility criteria. So yes, it, it was a concern, um, but I don't recall it was actually being discussed in the debates and exchanges over the design of the Constitution and white rights. Uh, but, Jamaica. but by that time, as you say, the, the, 
if they have been restricted. The um, immigration had been restricted. And of course, over a period of time, there was a gradual um, reduction in the, in the freedom of holders of Jamaican passports to travel to the UK. It started with something called an entry permit, and then eventually became a visa. Uh, Norman, I just want to pick you up from the beginning. You talk about the reinvention of the national project. I mean, to what extent is that possible, at least easily possible, in a society, within a world really, in which you have a substantial group of local actors who essentially see their own interests actually opposed to those of the people? Uh, and that one of the characteristics of the kind of neoliberal order is that you have in every part of the world substantial groups of people, including your professional brothers, economists quite often, um, uh, particular kinds of business interests who, who really are committed to working with uh, foreign powers to you know, sell the land of the country, to provide labor as cheaply as possible, to uh, create a controlled space for foreign investors. This is not a new story, of course, but it seems to me that if, you're, if we're looking at some place like Trinidad, uh, we have a, an executive that thinks of much of the population as a problem, uh, you know, as a problem to be managed, not in fact uh, uh, as citizens to be included. And I think that's only an extreme version of something which, is, which you see throughout the region. Trinidad and Ghana are probably the worst in this, in this, in this uh, case, where you actually have political elites that frankly uh, are in power and have a uh, uh, an extremely hostile relationship to a large part of the population. Uh, the national project seems to be very difficult to reanimate in these kinds of contexts. Well, as, especially if its reanimation requires a much greater degree of regionalism. And this is something that um, really comes home to me in, you know, all the time. I mean, you have a whole set for the last 50 or in some of the most recent countries being 20 years. Um, not one, but possibly two generations of people, first of all, of functionaries of one kind or another, uh, as well as um, the population at large who have grown up in, with forms of socialization in which they're taught national anthems, national flags, National pledges, national birds, <coughs> and all, all of these things. And so um, the notion of, which was in my generation, the West Indian nation, is alien, or at least they, they see the two things as being, as being fundamentally opposed. That's at the level of the population at large. But, and then you have, the, the, as you say, the class interests, or um, the elite interests. I mean, talk about shared representation. Let's give one example, which is shared diplomatic representation. It's actually called for in the treaty, revised treaty of travel rights. It doesn't compare, but it says countries shall explore and utilize shared diplomatic representation. And I speak about this every time I speak to regional, uh, regional audience. But the most, the people who are most opposed to it are the diplomats the functionaries of the, um, the, the ministries of foreign affairs and the ambassadors themselves. So you will have um, a situation where a small country, take the case in Beijing, you have about four or five independent states, each one with its own embassy. Now the embassy consists of one in the million plus maybe two or three people. And there's no way obviously they can, they can service um, a country of that China with that kind of stuff. But, try to get them to have a joint representation, collective representation, where each country specializes. No, all of the question. I mean, I, um, the other day I was driving in Port of Spain. The British High Commission has a very imposing building in the center of Port of Spain, but it now has a new sign up right next to the British High Commission. German Embassy. <laughs> so they're not sharing, I mean, but, but they're sharing a building, they're sharing facilities, and it's equal, the two signs are equal. Um, displayed. So I have to say to people, well, I guess Jamaica and St. Kitts and Grenada are much larger <laughs> and richer than Germany and the UK because you know, they have their fiscal issues are sharing a building, but we can't even do that. 
So yeah, that's the opposition. It, it speaks to the question of how do you get out of the conundrum when the very decision makers, the very people who are will be involved in changing or reforming the system are those that benefit from the maintenance of the existing system. So that is the conundrum, and that is why um, it reaches a point where I do say hold to the political scientists. <laughs> and that this moment, I believe in excellent, excellent presentation and very good discussion of issues. I mean, there's still, I am from a younger generation, obviously, but still a big issue in my mind is the issue of the development plan for the country. You know, we have thrown this out a long time ago. Um, nobody thinks that it is really important to do, particularly um, you know, at this time. And I think we need to return to some element of that. I mean, I was myself very disappointed when uh, the Vision 2020 project in Trinidad was discontinued. A project which actually involved participation by all walks of life in Trinidad and Jamaica. A plan that was put forward where people felt that they could have actually done something to change the course of the country. Um, and we have a couple of those kinds of projects. Maybe I'm not sure to what extent the Jamaican project is similar. But similar. We really, you know, we really need to see some of those projects actually come to fruition and actually also influence the regional landscape. Um, there's no attempt by CARICOM in any significant way. I know you have done a very good plan for you know, CARICOM vision, but there's no attempt to actually integrate these visions with the regional uh, vision. And I think we need to have a bit of that if some of those points you are not going to, to materialize. And I am, I don't want to say I'm a bit pessimistic about it, but you know, I'm not terribly optimistic that you know, that process is actually um, being properly seen. So I wanted your own personal comments on that. No, well, I have really um, thought that the Vision 2020 in Trinidad was a tremendous exercise, and it, it involved hundreds of um, professionals and leaders of civil society. And it, the, 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 um, the document is an extremely good document, it has very good analysis and information and identifies a course for the society. And unfortunately, it seems to have fallen foul to, again, the, the uh, party politics, because the new administration, well, first of all, it was apparently marginalized even before um, the Manning administration lost, and, and even more so now. Jamaica had a similar exercise, and also the vision, uh, the single development vision that in which I was involved in CARICOM um, was a similar exercise of, of utilizing the best ideas and information from a variety of stakeholders. The issue, so I mean the capacity is there. And I think we need perhaps to focus on that. That it, 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 we're not talking about um, pie in the sky. These exercises have been done and they demonstrate they can be done. And what needs to happen is a situation to be created where the political powers that be, if you like, are pressured, forced, coerced, or seat in their interest and move on uh, with implementation. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you for this lecture. No, 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 I agree with you uh, almost entirely, as you, as you would know. You have presented here national project, elements of national project. <coughs> There was one word that you uttered in your presentation, which I'm going to repeat to you in a minute. Uh, before I do that, uh, our mutual friend Herrera reviewed your book, recent book, recently, in which he put you together with uh, people like Samuel B and others. And the title of his review was Breaking Away from Eurocentric Thinking. Now, in your presentation, you utter two words which I think are the most significant words in your whole lecture. Breaking free. You use the word breaking free from the Westminster model, shackles. I would suggest breaking free, full stop. Not just from the Westminster model, but from the entire hegemonic economic system. In fact, in his review, he talks about you also, but not mentioning directly, you don't mention that word, decoupling, disengaged. 
and some of us have been arguing that the national project cannot move forward unless you actually disengage, decouple, delink. And perhaps that's, that's a challenge we have, and perhaps you might want to elaborate on your thinking on it. Yes. Well, I, 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 um, I think that is the, if you like, the fundamental task. I mean, everything else flows from that. And I even mentioned, um, you know, the sovereignty of the imagination, independent thought, emancipation from, from, um, from mental slavery. And that it begins in the mind. And I think this is the, the most um, difficult part of it, but in the, the most exciting part of it is to rethink from the um, perspective of our own experience and of our own history. That was the original mission of the New World Group. Unfortunately, it got um, diverted and it became eventually a market, but I think it's right back on the agenda. Uh, Professor Gerber, my complete agree to we need the invention of a new car in democracy. But uh, to face with the situ economic situation in having the Caribbean, which has been ongoing for some time, is it that much more fundamental with a failed economic model? And what should be evolved from what we have experienced now in the Caribbean? Definitely the economic, I, I, I don't even know what the economic model is now, <laughs> quite honestly. Um, but as I'm, I think I mentioned at some point, I, the economic model has to be fixed, but the economic model has to be fixed, but as a consequence of a process, if you like, of internal conversation, internal mobilization of the population, the en engagement of all uh, actors, political, social, and all forces in the society. The problem is, that when, you have, when politics consists of, if you like, what's the word in Trinidad, I have a word on the back of that. <laughs> <laughs> and in Jamaica, in other words, it bangarangs or whatever it is. So, in other words, of a, of a, of a, of a se, you know, sensational uh, gossip focus on the, on the um, fibers or the force of, of individual politicians. And you know, this one thief this and the other one thief. Yeah, but you thief when you went were in office, you thief or you didn't do this. It it gets in the way of this kind of conversation and dialogue about you know the kind of economic model that we need to generate. In other words, what I'm coming back is to say that before you fix the economic model, you have to get the politics right. I've seen lots more questions out. We can't take them all, unfortunately. Um, perhaps uh, I saw Jean, gentlemen at the back, Excellency. So um, if we take those three questions together, um, and then we can respond if that's OK. So um, I'll start with Jean, because I saw you had your hand up first, and then we'll move to the back and then we're excellent. Okay, I, I guess my question centers around something that might just run through the rest of the two days. But you hinted at your regionalism, and you, um, during your period in the Association of Caribbean States, certainly projected an understanding and a commitment to the greater Caribbean. So how do you um, see the Westminster model in comparison with the other political systems inherited from the other colonial powers um, in the region? Okay, big question. Yeah. Again, my, my question is to do with the, the, the Greater Caribbean. Um, I, I just wanted your view on what you thought of the fact that during the height of the economic crisis in, in the West, one of the immediate reactions in the Caribbean, um, before the effect even got, got to the Caribbean, was the chair of the Caribbean single market economy, Prime Minister Barbados, um, Stuart, Stuart Friddell, um, announcing that Caribbean regional integration, CSME, is not 
postponed. It's, it's not um, it's not postponed, but it's postponed. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, thank you. If you're familiar with the with the expression he used. Um, what what's your view? I mean, that's the reality on the ground, and I just wanted to know your view around those type of sentiments expressed by someone who should be leading the challenge to integration. Thank you. Um, my, my my question is is actually related to the question that you know, in physics, there is this law that says a body continues in a state of rest or motion unless, it's, unless an outside force acts upon it. So having heard all of this and looking at the going forward, what is it that is going to allow us to go forward? Or push us. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's an interesting question about the other political systems because um, I think it's very, very difficult, first of all, to generalize. Um, you're talking about uh, Venezuela, Colombia, Cuba, the DR, Central America. The only thing that these systems share in common is that they're all republics, or if you like, presidential systems, but they vary widely, of course, and they also vary widely in substance as well as in form. So it's one well, presidential system that we operate um, um, exactly like any other. So I, I really, I really don't know that. Gene, uh, <laughs> I think you're speaking to me. You're speaking to me at York, and they are. You're going to be at York, and I really haven't given much thought to this. But I must say that um, the exercise in Venezuela of convening a constituent assembly and rewriting the, the constitution thoroughly, and the content of that constitution in terms of what it says about gender and about um, community councils and about the rights of indigenous uh, minority, the rights of Afro-descendants. It's a very, very forward-looking constitution and the whole exercise of citizen involvement seems to me to be something that we could well uh, take, we could uh, take a leave out of the book. Of course, we don't have a choice, but um, we need to bear these, I think, these things in mind. You know, CLR James um, said, and in fact, before I come back to that, I'm going to come back to the other two questions. The CSME on pause, I have a, a, come to the conclusion that the basic problem of the CSME is not so much, and here Paul and Matthew are considering what I'm saying, is not so much the unwillingness to share sovereignty or to agree on an effective executive or legislative basis for it. I believe that that unwillingness stems from a deeper problem in CSME, which is that it is conceived as a form of market-led integration, which really has very, very limited benefits to offer in the particular circumstances of, um, of, 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 of the Caribbean. I mean, in, in Europe, 60% of, of Europe's foreign trade is with each other is within the European Union. In, in, in the Caribbean, it's something like 15 or 16 percent. And most of that is, is, comes about from trade and exports to the regional market. All, most of these other countries do not rely on CARICOM for the market and, and will not rely on the regional market, at least not as long as reliance is placed on market forces. There has to be a much more if you like, proactive form of regionalism, and um, I, 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 I mentioned um, food, sovereignty, energy, independence, I would say married and intra, intra-regional transport. In other words, prioritizing certain things in which governments will need to be actively involved, not by themselves, but and in, in collaboration with the private sector, but in a much more active way. I don't believe that you're going to get this by implementing the remainder of um, the CSME. Mm -hmm. I, I can, you know, there, uh, I've, I've um, spoken already about this and others how, and I can't go into any more details, but I think this is why, why I said this is the fundamental issue, really. Uh, now, what is the outside for $64 million question? I don't know if I'm going to what will push the system from its current um, trajectory? And the fact is we don't know, but we have to be, we have to be prepared. 
There's one thing that CLR James used to love to say. You never know when the masses are going to move. Um, nobody predicted 1935, 1936, 1937, 1938. Systems reach a point when, for one reason or another, they break down. They break down because the elites are so, um, uh, if you like, bankrupt, are, are in such a position where they have run out of options. They, they cannot manage the system. They cannot keep it together. And at, at, that, at that point, that creates possibilities for all kinds of change. There is no guarantee that the change that happens as a consequence will necessarily be productive or a constructive, a constructive one. They can degenerate. In, in all kinds of ways. But I think the role of ourselves, as, as if you like, the, the, the thinkers and the analysts, is to uh, keep analyzing about these things, keep talking, keep, and keep producing the kind of knowledge which can facilitate the transition, which we really don't know, we cannot predict exactly how and when it, it will happen. Outside force, who knows? You know, some form of, um, of, of, of um, well, put it, put it this way, I don't believe that um, external intervention is the answer. No, I don't think that's what you're saying. No. The outside force can come from within the society. Well, uh